So we call to everyone who registered. And available on MBHR's website, www.mbhr.org. All lines have been muted background noise. You may submit questions at any time during the webinar using the chat function or by emailing Tina Broder, our Senior Policy Manager, T Broder, that's T B O D E R, at mbhr.org. I also want to thank Tina for organizing today's webinar. We will have a question and answer period following all of the presentations. We will also make contact information for our presenters available after the webinar in case you'd like to communicate with them directly. Today our panelists will discuss, discuss issues of hepatitis health disparities and health equity in Indian country, including tribal efforts to implement syringe exchanges and tel telemedicine, the need for opioid substitution therapy and specialty providers, screening efforts in jails, and the concept of elimination communities. During this webinar, we expect that participants will learn about the many challenges faced by tribal communities, but also be inspired by the innovative strategies being employed to fight hepatitis C. I will provide a brief biography for each speaker before their presentation. Today we will start with Jessica Leston. Jessica is a healthcare advocate, clinical improver, technology enthusiast, and IHI improvement advisor. She has worked with tribal, tribal Health Services for 12 years and currently serves on the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. Please welcome. Good morning. Thank you so much. Um, so as the introduction gave, I work at the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, which serves the 43 tribes of Oregon and Idaho. But um, the work that I do is national in scope. I work very closely um, with tribes and organizations throughout Indian country on a lot of different issues, including hepatitis C. Just as a brief overview, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Indian Health Service and um, in general for Indian country, uh, just in case that some of you may be unfamiliar with that. So, service is part of the government, is a governmental agency that is and has been entrusted with being the primary health care provider for American Indian and Alaska Native people, um, and this is from treaties signed hundreds of years ago. IHS provides care to about 2 million American Indian and Alaska Native people that are represented by 150 different uh, through a large network of healthcare facilities, which include 46 hospitals, um, over 300 health centers, and 200 village clinics in the United States. 77% of those are owned and operated, and the rest are still run by the federal government. Most of those facilities provide primary care in fairly rural and remote settings, and they may be the only source of are within hundreds of miles, so sometimes you seriously have to drive um, three to four hours to get to any kind of secondary or tertiary care. So over the next 10 minutes or so, um, I'm going to try to unpack a little bit of the public health response to hepatitis C in Indian country um, and set up for some of the um, looks that Dr. Mara and Mr. Forstar will give um, highlighting some of the really innovative things that are being done. So next slide. I think you know it's just really important to be aware nationally um, that this is a really important issue that everybody is dealing with. Um, hepatitis C deaths and um, if you're looking at hepatitis C deaths and then the deaths from other, all other nationally notifiable infectious diseases from 2000, 2013, you can see in 2013 um, hepatitis C leads all of those combined and as we all know we're at just the very start of this epidemic so the, that um, those deaths from hepatitis C will increase as more people who have had hepatitis C for 20 to 30 years, um, and if they don't get treatment, um, will also die. Next slide. 
And although hepatitis C data for American Indian and Alaska Native populations is extremely limited, uh, national surveillance and other data does suggest a disproportionate burden of hepatitis C infection, um, and then also associated morbidity and mortality compared with other populations. If you look at the incidence of acute hepatitis C by race and ethnicity from 2000 to 2013, very clearly in blue American Indian and Alaska Native people have a significantly um, higher proportionate burden of acute hepatitis C when compared with other race and ethnicities. Next slide. If you look at hospitalizations from hepatitis C, um, you can see a, over a 300% increase in hepatitis C related hospitalizations for American Indian and Alaska Native people from 1995 to 2007. And this follows similar national trends um, th that can be seen in other race and ethnicities. Next slide. And then finally, if you look at hepatitis C related mortality by race and ethnicity from 2007 and compare that to 2011, um, you can see that American Indian Alaska Native people have higher rates of mortality, um, hepatitis C related mortality compared to other race and ethnicities. Um, and this can be due to a number of different factors that we see in other diseases as well, but screening, management, access to care, and, and other comorbid factors um, related to hepatitis C. Next slide. So there's good and there's bad news. You want to just, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so um, new treatment options really can have a huge impact nationally and in Indian country. Uh, new hepatitis C can now be cured for a lot of people, way more than before. Um, and cure, curing hepatitis C reduces mortality and morbidity, and then it also um, reduces the risk of trans we can start to curb um, transmission of hepatitis C as well. Uh, these new therapies have improved um, SVR and um, few contraindications and side effects. But uh, the bad news is that hepatitis C is largely an unrecognized public health problem. Um, it's largely invisible by a lot of people, um, both by the public, medical providers, policymakers. Um, I mean, just by a lot of people. And although these new therapies are cited as being cost effective, um, it doesn't mean that they're affordable to a vast majority of people, um, especially when you're talking about a disease that affects so many. Um, and, you know, in pretty marginalized populations. Um, so if you're looking at this disease that has the highest mortality of all other infectious diseases and access to treatment is complicated, um, it, it really does beg the need for a um, very purposeful response to what we're doing to treat this disease that's now curable. And uh, the good news is, if you push one forward, is that I do think that we can change this um, collectively. You can see a lot of things going on in Indian country right now um, and in the broader U.S. too. Um, so, I mean, the impact potential is definitely there. Next slide. Back the layers of this public health response just by looking at the hepatitis C cascade. Um, what we've tried to do, you know, when you look at all these 3.5 million people who are chronically infected um, in the United States, you know, the just like in the HIV cascade, there are steps that we need to do in order to get more people successfully treated and cured. Those that have um, diagnostics with um, case management and laboratory uh, access. It has to do with consultations, especially when you're dealing with the Indian Health Service in um, mostly primary care physicians in very rural settings. Um, it, 
has to do with access to these drugs um, and, and, and just continued case management. And all of this is like within this web of um, really good communications, systems and strategic thinking, um, and being able to manage conflict and change when you're, especially when you're talking about these treatments that are really um, changing and improving at a very rapid pace. Next slide. So in response to the 2012 recommendations by the CDC and U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, IHS created a hepatitis C measure to be tracked at most um, Indian Health Service tribal and urban facilities. And um, what we have seen is uh, over, the, over the last three and a half years, over a 400% increase in screening um, at all of our at all of our clinics, and you know, this is this varies. Um, our highest service unit has 72. I think maybe our highest one has 78 percent screening coverage now, um, which is great. As more as more people are being screened, though, we really need to prepare for the challenges that are going to be associated with this increased identification of persons who are living with hepatitis C, because in the end, that means there's going to be more people um, that need access to treatment. Next slide. So if we look at best practices from what we've seen in Indian countries so far, they include the use of electronic health records and reminders um, to trigger screening and also trigger follow-up confirmation testing, um, liver panels, uh, hepatitis A screening, HIV screening, and so on. Uh, it includes quick picks and automation to make these things um, to make it harder to not do these things um, since they are quality of care. They include standing orders and making sure that everybody in the healthcare facility is operating at the highest level of their licensure. So not so uh, physicians aren't necessarily the ones that need to be ordering these screenings and routine lab tests, although they're signing off for it. Um, if this is just routine care, to make sure that anybody could do it so that the physician is left to more diagnostic um, care. Clear delegation of who is doing the screening and the follow-up of these patients. Um, making sure that there is formal policy in place and training for clinics and providers who are going to be treated with this. There's a huge leadership component when you're dealing with any kind of emergent public health issue, and hepatitis C is no different, um, strong leadership is absolutely necessary to help bring the clinic, um, uh, to help lead the clinic in a public health, a public health response to hepatitis C, uh, and also access to innovations. So we have been seeing a lot of primary care uh, leads that are treating hepatitis C, a lot of pharmacies, that, are, that have hepatitis C clinics, um, and also the use of teleconsultation, especially for the Indian Health Service when you're dealing with those huge distances between um, specialists and the primary care provider and the patient. Next slide. So what we've seen in some preliminary epi from the Indian Health Service is that there is a barbell epi curve split between those people who are newly diagnosed baby boomers with long-standing infection, people who in large part need treatment much faster, and then uh, younger newly infected youth. And whereas in the broader U.S. there may be um, maybe more people in the baby boomer age range, that effect is a little bit less in Indian country. We, we tend to see maybe a 40 to 60 split between people born between 1945 and not. The younger hepatitis oh, can you go back? Thanks. The younger hepatitis C patients are, are believed to be predominantly injection drug users as per the wider US population. Um, and we have about a two to 12 percent uh, zero prevalence in all of our clinics. Slide. So in order for this to be effective, um, it requires access. Um, 
it requires access for them to be meaningful to our population. So an effective public health response definitely requires looking across the spectrum of interrelated healthcare delivery organizations to adopt to this changing environment. Um, and that really is going to depend on the skills and adaptability of the organization's employees, their relationships, their interactions, and uh, the communication of the organization and the learning that they are able to access and um, what they're able to teach everybody else. So uh, this is a, a photo of Cherokee Nation. Dr. Mira will be talking later and you know their leadership and their organization, what they have been able to bring to the you know the broader infrastructure and learning ability of the of Indian country has been really amazing. I mean, it has shown that you know, although these medications are expensive and although the public health response to hepatitis C is very complicated, um, we can still do it. Next slide. I just wanted to say a little bit something I, w I wouldn't have felt good about myself if I didn't talk a little bit about the inequitable funding um, between the two federal health care agencies, and that's the Veterans Association and the Indian Health Service. Um, since 2014, the, the VA has incredible amounts of money to treat hepatitis C, starting with $379 million in 2014, and then just this last year, uh, $3 billion to um, be dispersed over the next two years to, to VA for treatment for hepatitis C, um, while the Indian Health Service has gotten no increase in funding for um, providing that same level of care to its patients. So, you know, if you're talking about human rights and health equity, um, you know, they shouldn't be just vague principles and ideals. They should not be just mere suggestions. Um, they should be operational. And uh, increased funding to treat American Indian Alaska Native people um, is definitely needed. Absolutely. Um, especially when you're talking about this marginalized and already discriminated against population. Now so I, I think I'm just going to leave. There are some redesigns that are necessary um, to respond to hepatitis C. And I won't go over all of these, but um, there are some really significant issues that uh, broader we need to start to have conversation about and address systematically um, and collaboratively in order for us to have a real um, meaningful impact on the hepatitis C epidemic and um, save hundreds of thousands of people's lives. Um, and, and this is just, we, we absolutely need hacking so that we can actually, actually do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we will turn to Dr. Jorge Mera. Dr. Mera is the Director of Infectious Diseases for Cherokee Nation Health Services. He is responsible for surveillance policies and programs to treat and prevent the transmission of HIV and hepatitis C. Dr. Mera also serves as the Director of the AIDS Education and Training Center local performance site at Cherokee Nation. Please welcome Dr. Mera. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation uh, and sharing this panel with uh, such distinguished speakers. So uh, next slide, please. So I'm going to try uh, in the next few minutes to give you a really brief overview of Cherokee Nation Health Services, um, just to put you in context. Uh, what, what were the events that led us to start a hepatitis C elimination program? And uh, some of our uh, progress to date, our goals, and the challenges that uh, we have faced, and hopefully give you uh, some ideas or motivations to start similar programs uh, in your sites. Next. So uh, Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation uh, within the United States. Uh, it is located in the northeastern part of Oklahoma. Uh, it has over 300,000 uh, citizens. 
uh, but around 130,000 Native Americans live in the area, and that's the ones that we uh, provide medical services for the most part, although any uh, Cherokee or Native American can travel and be seen in, in our hospital. And uh, um, the main hospital is located in Tahlequah, Oklahoma, which is about an hour northeast of Tulsa. Uh, next, please. So this is the 14 counties of uh, Cherokee Nation, and the red uh, circle is our first hepatitis C clinic that was established in 2012. Can you move forward, please, the slide? So in 2012, we um, I started working here, and on my first day of work, I had a backlog of 263 HCV positive patients that needed to be evaluated. That same year, uh, around October, I believe the CDC came out with the birth cohort recommendation for screening, uh, meaning that everybody born between 1945 and 1965 should be uh, tested for hepatitis C. This recommendation came from uh, uh, epidemiological studies uh, done at, uh, through the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, also known as NHANES. Um, but interestingly, this survey did not uh, uh, address Native American communities. Actually, they were Included from this survey, and it is an important point that I will uh, bring up in in, uh, in a few more slides. Uh, so in 2013, next please, uh, we I had uh, was the only infectious disease provider, the only one um, evaluating and treating hepatitis C, and that year we treated 200. I'm sorry, we evaluated 230 patients, and we were only able to treat a little bit over 10 percent, 29, because at that moment we still were using interferon-based regimens to treat. Uh, hepatitis C, and, is, and of those who are aware of these regimens, they are very toxic, they prolong a lot of side effects. Most people have contraindications even to start them. In, the same year, in that same year, we partnered with uh, IHS, specifically Jessica and Briggs, uh, Jessica Lesting and Brig Riley, and they helped me install the electronic health care reminder for hepatitis C screening, among other, among other uh, uh, reminders like HIV and chlamydia. Um, and that was very useful for us to increase our hepatitis C screening. Uh, next. And in that same year, I, what I noticed was basically that there were a lot of patients already diagnosed with hepatitis C, that much more were going to be diagnosed with the screening uh, techniques that we were implementing, and I was the only provider for hepatitis C. Uh, I was not going to be able to uh, evaluate all the patients that needed evaluation and uh, less treat them. So I got involved with the University of New Mexico ECHO program. ECHO stands for Extended Community Health Outcomes. And basically it's a telehealth conferencing in which you communicate with primary care providers in other areas um, close to your hospital or not so close. And you give guidance to primary care physicians, nurse practitioners or PAs and, and pharmacists on how to treat hepatitis C. And that has proven uh, to expand your clinical capacity of, of uh, evaluation and treatment. So in the map that you see there on the red, the red circle is the only hepatitis C clinic we had in 2013. And all the red crosses are, are outlying clinical sites in which uh, Native Americans access healthcare in, in Cherokee Nation. Next. Next. So through the implementation of the reminder, and I'll show you a little bit more data on that, we increased our screening and also with the, the help of the ECHO program, the telehealth conferencing, we were able to um, start four other hepatitis C clinics as you see in the map in the red circles. Um, in 2014, we already had detected over 700 patients. Our treatment had increased to 92 patients. And we also partner with Oklahoma University, uh, the Oklahoma State Health Department, uh, and Yale to help us on our epidemiological studies. At that moment, uh, the estimate of our prevalence was 5.8%. This is not a population-based study estimate. This is uh, basically patients who access our system and we serotest and they are positive. So it is, a, in a way, a biased population, but that was our, our best measurement at that moment. Uh, next. So in 2015, uh, we already had detected almost 1,000 seropositive patients, had treated uh, over almost 300 of them in the four uh, hepatitis C outline clinics as well as the clinic at Hastings Hospital. And that's when we uh, realized that we had a, a bigger uh, challenge. And so we partnered with the CDC 
who encouraged us to start an elimination program, and the CDC, uh, through the CDC Foundation, helped us to get funding so we could actually start the program. The funding was basically designed to increase screening and clinical capacity to evaluate and treat hepatitis C, as well as uh, to do epidemiological studies to identify in more, with more precision or the transmission dynamics of hepatitis C at Cherokee Nation. We know intravenous drug use is a major cause, but it, the way that intravenous drug use is being, uh, uh, it's transmitting the disease varies according to different communities. <clears throat> so when you embark in yourself in, in, in an elimination program, you have to realize that you not only need to diagnose and treat those patients who have hepatitis C for many years, but you need to also cut transmission, and that's a, a very big challenge, but a doable uh, challenge. So in this slide, uh, I'm showing you how the electronic health care reminder and uh, basic education to our medical providers improve screening. So in the brown bars are the screening percentages uh, from 2012 to 2013, and on the uh, uh, green bars are the ones in, from 2014 and 15. And as you can see, the increase in screening was dramatic. From an average of about 12%, it went up to an average of about 60%. Now, what does this mean? These are patients who meet the baby boomer uh, criteria, born between 1945 and 65, who access primary care clinics at the Cherokee Nation Health Services. So this does not include patients who don't access the system, of course, and also patients who would access other uh, areas that are not primary care. For example, if a patient comes to a dental clinic or optometrist or just to, uh, to the pharmacy to pick up a prescription, they would not be offered screening. So it, it is a limited screening site within the Cherokee Nation. Next. Next. So here, the, the previous percentages, and you know, percentages could be based on 10 or 20 patients, and that's why I want to to show you the absolute number of screened patients uh, that, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the, the absolute number of patients that we were able to screen in those years. So in the, from 2010 to 2012, basically, we were screening about 500 baby boomers per year. Next. And when we introduced just education, basically, the CDC recommended baby boomers should be screened. So I just went through, through the each outlying clinic and educated the providers, we had an increase in screening. Next. But when we introduced the electronic healthcare reminder and another round of education on how to use it, and like Jessica mentioned, uh, we empowered the nurses. We didn't leave this task to the providers because they, they were too busy doing other things. They will not remember to, to click. And the nurses were, uh, we thought, a better uh, target for this. And you can see that we tripled our uh, screening of uh, baby boomers just by implementing those two basic tools. Next. So when we analyzed the number of patients uh, we had seen the first year, uh, next, this is the number these are the number of patients according to the a, the year they were born, and on these uh, purple on this purple square, you can see what the baby where the baby boomers fit next. Now our population was a little bit younger, so more than and right now more than 50% of our population do not belong that are hepatitis C positive do not belong to the baby boomers. So if we would just uh, I lost the screen. Okay, if we if we just stick to screening baby boomers, we would be missing a lot of patients who have hepatitis C and need treatment. And this is why it's important for you to look where you where you work. What what is the percentage of your hepatitis C positive patients that are baby boomers and which are not? Because it might lead you to change screening techniques. Next. Okay, so uh, in, in January of 2014, uh, next please. Uh, the direct antiviral agents were introduced into the market, and that what basically that did was uh, enable us to use interferon-free regimens to treat patients. Now, as you can see, from January to August, we did treat uh, some patients, but not much because that's what's oh, that. The only one that was that was treating patients was me. Next, so in around uh, August and September, we trained through the ECHO program uh, 
five primary care providers and two pharmacists, and we started the outline echo clinics that I mentioned. Also, we had new direct antiviral agents introduced into the market that, that around that month. And as you can see in the yellow line, the cumulative amount of people that we treated skyrocketed. So by September of last year, we had treated around 270 patients. And right now, we're at around 350 that uh, we were able to engage in care and treat. Next. So that's when we decided to start an elimination program. And I'll show you in the next few slides what were our goals. So the first goal, as Jessica mentioned, was political commitment. This is critical for any uh, project, and especially if you're trying to eliminate a disease uh, from your uh, region. And in this slide is Chief uh, Bill John Baker, the Chief of the Cherokees, with uh, the Deputy Chief. And in the background are representatives from the administration of our hospital, as well as Dr. Ward, Dr. Merman, who are the CDC uh, Directors for Viral Hepatitis. Uh, next. So our second goal was to expand our screening program and uh, as I mentioned, most of our, uh, of our patients do not belong to the baby boomer category. So we expanded age targeted screening from 20 to 69 years old. Uh, our goal in the next three years is to sero test 84,000 patients, which represents 85% of the targeted uh, population. The hepatitis C screening will be triggered by the electronic health record as is, that has as we were doing in the past. But we also introduced lab-triggered screening, meaning any patient who comes into the hospital who gets a lab drawn for any reason, if they fit, fit the age to 69, the phlebotomist will extra, uh, extract an extra tube for hepatitis C testing. And that has, so far, has given us great results, and I'll show you a slide. We also uh, implemented this year dental uh, screen, I mean, screening for hepatitis C in the dental department. And as I mentioned in a, a few slides back, you know, uh, uh, electronic health records trigger screening in the primary care level only detects people who come to the primary care. But if patients are going to other areas of the hospital in which you don't have these reminders installed, they won't get screened. Our dental clinic uses a different electronic health record. So we decided to uh, start screening every, offer screening and perhaps see on every patient who makes the age criteria there. We started two weeks ago. I don't have any results to show you in this area, but I think this is going to be a very um, important site in our, in our system to screen patients. It captures a different population probably, and the beauty is that we're using rapid testing and that permits us to engage the patients in care quicker. Next. So going back to lab trigger screening, uh, defined as any patient who comes to the hospital who has a lab ordered for any reason will get screened for hepatitis C if they um, meet, meet the age criteria. So in three months, this is November of 2015 until February of this year, we screened over five, almost 5,000 patients in a three-month period, uh, which will basically double the screening we've done in the past year. And we detected 250 C 257 positive patients for hepatitis C. Now, uh, of these, the majority we already knew they were hepatitis C positive. Since this was lab trigger screening, uh, the risk with this is that you might rescreen people who are already po that you know they are positive. So, out of these 257, 95 were new Hep C positive patients for us. And of these 95 on the right side, you can see the bars. 60 of them were not baby boomers. Only 35 were baby boomers. So if we would be doing only CDC recommendations for baby boomers, we would be missing uh, more than half uh, of our patients who have hepatitis C. Next, please. So our third goal was to increase linkage to care, evaluation, and treatment, and we've implemented a centralized screening reporting. What that means is we have one person whose only job is to track all the serology reports done in, during that day and contact these patients if they were not uh, screened by rapid testing, contact the patients and get them an appointment to come back in to get a viral load and also an appointment with a provider. We expanded the use of rapid screening. Basically, all our, our, our clinics are doing rapid tests, which you get a result in 20 minutes. And you can tell the patient if they're positive that they need to get a viral load, and you do it right then and there. And also, you can give them an appointment and educate the patient to improve retention and, and, and care. And we expanded our echo clinics. I showed you in the previous slides five sites. Now we have seven sites. 
and we have recruited 20 primary care providers, which includes physicians, nurse practitioners, and physician assistants, as well as eight, as eight pharmacists. And I'll, I'll spend just 30 seconds here on the pharmacists. I think the pharmacists are a key component on uh, the uh, treatment of patients. So all our patients are evaluated by a primary care provider, but sometimes that provider is very busy and cannot deal with the treatment despite the fact that it's a pretty simple treatment. I mean, it's one pill a day for 12 weeks for the majority of patients, and you're cured uh, with a 95% cure rate. But if the provider is very busy, we ask them just refer the patient to your pharmacist and in the same clinic, and the pharmacist uh, will, will uh, engage in treating that patient for the 12 weeks and follow them very closely. And they've, gonna, they've done so far a marvelous job and then help us move our, uh, expand our treatment program. Um, and also uh, another goal is to expand our case manager workforce. As Jessica mentioned, getting medications is not easy, <clears throat> but it's definitely not impossible. Uh, I don't. I, I think we only had uh, one patient in all the over 300 patients we've treated that we had a uh, difficult problem getting medications for them. On the most patients, it was just a lot of paperwork, a lot of hours sitting in a chair in front of a desk and a telephone for the case manager, but at the end of the day, they would get the medications for our patients, most, most of them through patient assistance programs. Next. So our goals regarding treatment are to treat 85% of those patients who have a, a chronic uh, hepatitis C infection, which would be about 2,500 patients, we estimate. Uh, and to cure uh, at least 85% of them. I just want to mention that cure rates are 95% in clinical trials and also in the real world when you're able to follow the patient until they come back for their uh, test of cure. The problems we're having is that many patients, once they're treated, despite the fact that they're most likely cured, they don't come back to for test of cure. So the intention to treat cure that we're seeing is around 86-87%. Uh, but in those patients who come back for the test of cure, it's around 93 to 95 percent. Um, next. So this is the, a, a critical slide in when you have an elimination program, because when you don't have an elimination program, you just need to treat everybody who has the infection so they don't develop end-stage liver disease or liver cancer or and cirrhosis. But when you're uh, uh, pioneering a, an elimination program, you not only need to treat those patients, but you need to prevent transmission. And, tra and preventing transmission uh, has uh, several pillars. Um, one is educate the public, and that's uh, we have the Oklahoma State Health Department starting on a program to educate the public on how tra transmission happens and how you can prevent that. And just to give you an example, uh, we all know that intra uh, intravenous drug use is not easy to prevent or stop, uh, but tattooing um, is easy to control if you have the right rules in place. And we think tattooing in uh, uh, Native Americans is a maybe a problem in HCV transmission, and we're doing an epi study just to look at that factor and see if it is a problem or not. Treatment as prevention basically means treating everybody who has hepatitis C. If you cure them, they cannot transmit the infection. And your target population for this would be your your transmitters, which are basically the people who are actively using drugs. Um, contact tracing, we've implemented this recently. We are in the phase that we train the personnel. We have not started doing it. We'll hope, hopefully we'll, we will in the next few months. And this is just basically the same thing that the State Health Department does with HIV and syphilis, meaning any acute case of, F, <coughs> sorry, of hepatitis C, you would contact the patient and ask them who did you share drugs with or who you were, did you get your tattoo from, et cetera, follow those, try to contact those patients and offer them testing and engagement and care if they're positive. Opioid substitution programs are uh, needed. Uh, we have one of our providers starting to develop an naltrexone program. Uh, we chose this because it's a monthly injection, probably easier to deliver, uh, and it doesn't have the, the risk of overdose as other program, other drugs do. Um, although there always is a, a risk. And finally, needle exchange programs are something that we really need, and most of the mathematical modeling that has been done for elimination of hepatitis C includes needle exchange, exchange programs as part of the, of the modeling. In Oklahoma, uh, needle exchange programs are, are illegal, uh, and we're working closely with the legislature to see if we can um, change this and although Cherokee Nation is a sovereign nation, they probably could decide to do this without violating any law or state law, 
we think that the best place to do this, and we'll have a speaker that might clarify or, or, or disagree with me, uh, is probably in, uh, if we set it up in, in pharmacies, because we have pharmacies in every every clinic uh, in our uh, health services, and it would be a great uh, a place to uh, implement these programs if we could get uh, legislation approval for that, because our pharmacies are state licensed, and uh, even if Cherokee Nation implements an needle exchange program, we couldn't use your, our pharmacists unless the state would, would give us a waiver to do that. Next. So uh, finally, uh, we are modeling uh, our, the transmission dynamics of hepatitis C. We're uh, uh, using a group of mathematicians at Yale University who have developed a mathematical model, and that will help us in the future to know where we should be focusing more intensively. Uh, is it, uh, you know, in, a, in prevention of transmission through needle exchange programs, treatment as prevention, etc. And we have also established an advisory committee that will help us assist in uh, developing short and long-term goals. Next. So the challenges we face so far are many, and these are just the ones that I remember on top of my head or the most, uh, the ones that take my sleep at night is first that electronic health records are not pop-ups, at least in our system, so you have to click, you have to be reminded that there's a reminder and uh, pop-ups pop would be great if we have them. Uh, not all patients access the health system, so you're not going to be screening those. You, you need to have reach out programs in the community to screen those patients. Um, Engagement in care still is a problem. Not only the work ends when you identify a patient who's hep C positive, but you need to get them back in your clinics for further testing and evaluation and treatment. And we still have a hard time trying to do that in 20 or 30 percent of our patients. Uh, treatment procure procurement is complex. There's a lot of case management work, and uh, treatment failures are a little bit more frequent in the real world because uh, the clinical trials usually select patients that that will probably comply with all the treatment and in the real world that is not always true. There are uh, difficult to treat populations uh, and to reach especially which are people who inject drugs, people who are incarcerated, homeless, and people with uh, who abuse alcohol. And those are areas that you need to focus very intensively especially when you want to eliminate hepatitis C. And finally, you know, political uh, challenges are always there. Needle exchange programs is one for us right now, and I'm sorry for the typo on programs there. And also funding of the elimination program. You know, we uh, hope to get funded for uh, on the subsequent years, but that's always a, a challenge. And like Jessica mentioned, there are a lot of disparities when you look at uh, the funding that Native American communities get compared to other types of communities, and we need a lot of uh, activism. Um, to uh, make those changes happen. Next. And I think that's it. Okay, well, thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions uh, from the viewers. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, our final speaker today, and then we will get into some questions, uh, is Chris Forstar. Chris Forstar's experience with hepatitis C is rooted in the Fort Peck reservation in Montana. In 2009, Chris created a needle exchange in Fort Peck in response to the hepatitis C endemic. He worked for the Fort Peck Tribal Health Department for almost eight years and is well versed in discussions surrounding the lack of treatment access and harm reduction services in Native American communities. Please welcome Mr. Forstar. And we have about 15 minutes left uh, for the webinar. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> or morning. I want to Appreciate the time. Um, just to give you a little background on Fort Peck, um, we have a uh, Indian Health Service uh, at Fort Peck IHS, but we also have a Tribal Health Department, which serves as the legal health authority, uh, essentially the public health um, uh, agency. Next slide, please. So this is just a little map of Montana and showing you where Fort Peck is at. The northern border there is Canada, so uh, Fort Peck is just right below uh, the Canadian border. We have two tribes on Montana or on Fort Peck: uh, the uh, Sinaboyan tribe as well as the Sioux tribe. Uh, total membership of Fort Peck Reservation is about 14,000 members. Next slide, please. And just go ahead and advance it one more. Thank you. Um, so. The need for the needle exchange kind of, you know, 
came from hepatitis C, and the hepatitis C um, didn't come from the baby boomers as we all have been talking about. Um, it came through the prenatal population at Fort Peck. Um, the prenatal population was the only uh, population being screened regularly at Fort Peck during the time, uh, 2001, 2002. After that, um, the CDC, um, with its VHIP program, came to Fort Peck, and the VHIP program started um, screening in the jails at Fort Peck. There was an individual at Fort Peck who would go into the jails and actively um, draw blood for every hepatitis C um, that was tested there at Fort Peck. So this was between 2003 and 2005. Um, then during 2005, 2006, there was a hepatitis C study done by um, Indian Health Service. From that, um, it resulted in a 5.1% 5 5 .1 um, hepatitis C positive rate for the child bearing age for the young women. Uh, advance it the rest of the way, please. So in 2008, the Corpac tribes requested um, IHS to do a outbreak investigation. This was led by us in the CDC. Um, if you want to advance the rest of the way. One more. And this was really what spurred the um, the whole movement at Fort both tribal and in the health service to uh, address the high rates of uh, hep as a result of that, um, tribal on the tribal side, um, with the discussion for creating a needle exchange program, because at the time the federal hands were tied through Indian Health Service to establish a needle exchange program. Um, Indian Health Service was more focused on the treatment of the individuals. We have no medical providers at Tribal Health, but that's where Indian Health Service comes into play, and there is definitely uh, a good working relationship between Tribal Health and Indian Health Service at Fort Peck. Next slide, please. So this is the whole decision at the, of the needle exchange at the reservation level um, started looking around at other needle exchange programs because starting from scratch. Um, looked at all the reservations in Montana. There was no other needle exchange program going on. Uh, Montana is one of those states uh, Dr. Mira pointed out that it's actually illegal. Um, Montana is not allowed. It's kind of a gray area on the on the. Um, so we called around to Indian Health Service, asked them uh, if they knew of any programs going on. The only program at that time, back in 2008, 2009, that was going on was down in Phoenix area. Uh, the Pima Reservation had a needle exchange going on. However, it wasn't really applicable to us at Fort because we are so rural. Um, what works for them definitely us. So we started investigating the harm reduction philosophy. Uh, it really identified with us uh, from a native perspective. And we always kind of kept hepatitis C as the forefront when we would speak to our uh, tribal council. Next slide, please. And one more. There you go. Um, the decision of where to start basically started to start actually talking with the high-risk uh, individuals for hepatitis C, and this meant actually going out and talking with injection drug users. We got IRB approval from uh, Montana State University. They were our partners with this, as well as we got approval from Tribal Council to do a research study to go out and talk with 51 injection drug users. And I'll show you the visual component of that slide next. So we did tracing through the RDS sampling technique through this uh, closed network of individuals. And this is what it resulted in. And the reason why we started talking with these individuals was to get an idea of how to actually create a needle exchange program. Not only that, but at, to ask what the high-risk behaviors were and to try to understand the um, high risk going on. One of the things that we discovered through this investigation was that everybody 
wanted to be safe. They all knew that there was high rates of hepatitis C out there, and they all took their own precautions. Uh, however, um, a lot of those precautions weren't effective. So at bare minimum, if we never had any contact with these individuals again, we gave them the correct information at the very end of the, the uh, 30 minutes interview. Uh, however, a lot of these, uh, pretty much every person that we interview, every 51, every person that took part of the, the research component came back later to become part of the, uh, the actual program once we got it up and going. Please. This is another uh, smaller, but yet still pretty impressive. There's 14 individuals on here. Uh, he heard about the um, the research study going on, so we started him on his own little map there. Next slide. So once we got all the data collected, we came to council. Data and had a three-hour lengthy discussion. Uh, like I said it was never done before. Uh, at Fort Peck or any in the country besides Kima, uh, nor in Montana. And after a uh, lengthy three-hour discussion, uh, the Tribal Council approved it. A uh, little side point, the uh, kids in the picture there weren't part of the discussion. That's a different story altogether. Uh, this was back in 2009. And after that is when we started the needle exchange program. Next slide, please. So a major component of any needle exchange program is law enforcement. We met with law enforcement. The cities, we have two larger cities on the reservation. I say larger, I say cities loosely. They're about 6,000 population total. Um, in the county, <clears throat> we have a perfect reservation encompasses four counties in Montana. And we had, we do have drug enforcement agents there at Perfect. We met with those agencies. And right away, they were very supportive of the idea of a needle exchange program. Uh, this caught me off guard, to be honest. Uh, I thought they were going to be very opposed to the idea of doing a needle exchange program. But what the chief of police told me was anything that we can do to prevent their officers, uh, to keep their officers safe, they're in support of. So after that meeting, we got a memorandum of understanding signed between everybody, between the tribes and all these law enforcement agencies to put it on paper, on record, that we are there as a public health uh, agency and uh, to collect the syringes and distribute syringes. And we are not to be harassed by the law enforcement and be tracked and uh, it's all. So from there, we started the actual syringe exchange at the end of June of 2009. Next slide, please. The operations of it, this was all based upon discussions with the clients. Nobody thought it would be very effective to have a fixed site location, so it was all based upon 100. And the way it ended up being developed was primarily by texting uh, on cell phones. It was always a one-for-one -one exchange program that was decided by council, the legislative body of our government. And all total, we had close to 100 primary clients. Uh, after a client was established with us, they would start exchanging for their family and friends that whom they use with. We had two workers total, and the workers that we used was myself and another individual. We had other job duties, so this needle exchange program was always an auxiliary part of our job duties. We had an agreement with the in-house service where they pay for the disposal of the sharps. It was always funded through different multiple grants, uh, private foundation organizations, where we paid for the, the supplies and the syringes. All told, the first time around, the program was operational for 18 months, and it ended the first time in January 2011 for the reason they ended the first time after change of tribal health directors. Uh, the tribal health director of 28 years retired. And the person who replaced him wasn't in favor of the idea of doing an needle exchange program. And uh, just to kind of address Dr. Mira's comment about uh, the state being um, illegal but being legal on the reservation, is that Montana is considered a disclaimer state. 
where they just claim to have any uh, jurisdiction over a reservation, and that's a federal stipulation because before Montana became a state, the federal government uh, stipulated to Montana that they had to do that in order to become a state from a, from a territory to a state. So it's in the preamble of the Constitution of Montana. So because of that little clause in the preamble, we were able to uh, move forward with it. And subsequently, uh, in Montana, there was another open needle exchange in Missoula. They opened up in 2012, I believe. And next slide. Um, oh, sorry, we'll go back one more. All told, at the end, uh, we had distributed 8,000 needles, and we had collected over 9,000 needles. I think it says a lot that we collected more needles than we distributed. Move forward. Um, just recently, as of this year, beginning of this year, uh, the Fort Peck Tribal Council brought the program back under the new Tribal Health Director because of the increasing rates of rejection and drug use as well as hepatitis C. Move forward, please. Um, these two articles are different articles, and this is from February uh, 18, 2016, so a month ago. They got some supplies from Tribal Health and they uh, to their front page story, the local travel paper. Next slide, please. So the next steps, because of the post ban being lifted, collaborations are being worked out between the in house service and the county health departments. Uh, we are talking about creating fixed site locations where it will not only just be 100% outreach, we're having outreach workers go out and meet the uh, clients, but having sites available where the clients can come into a, a fixed site at the clinics or the health department to exchange. Um, because of the ban being lifted, partially lifted, we can secure more funding sources to have a more steady stream of funding for these uh, needle exchange programs. Next slide, please. So moving on beyond prevention, uh, looking at what have, Cherokee has been doing, on the great work there. Uh, Corpac does have an ECHO program, and they were actually the first non-New Mexico location uh, back in 2009 uh, with Dr. Brad Moran, he's the pharmacist at uh, chief pharmacist at Corpac. They have been actually part of ECHO since 2009. Um, we're creating a hepatitis C task force where it's a collaborative partnership between and tribal health, so we have a coordination of care to best serve the hepatitis C positive patients. Uh, Trouble Health is going out and doing targeted testing on high risk hepatitis C patients as well as community based screenings. This has really been non existent since the VHIP program, which ended in 2005. And next slide. That is it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you uh, for all three of those wonderful presentations, really learned a lot. Uh, we are running up against the hour. Tina, I think we'll take one question, um, but want to encourage um, everyone, if you have a question, please do send it to MBHR, tbroder at mbhr.org, or info at org, and we will make sure we get your question answered and sent to you. Uh, Tina, I'll turn it to you for question, um, and then we'll close. Um, so we have a lot of great questions, and I think um, many of the statements are quite provocative and inspiring. I think I, I got a lot of ideas as well um, from some of the innovative strategies that are being employed. Um, the question I'll ask is um, what can folks who are working in the broader hepatitis advocacy um, and, com and community uh, do to help elevate uh, some of these issues and health disparities as well as um, adopt some of the practices and some of your learning? I think this is Jessica, and I think that one of the big things with, um, for instance, the inequitable um, level of funding to American Indian and Alaska Native people compared with uh, levels of funding, for instance, to the Veterans Association is um, honestly just as local citizens um, taking that to um, your senator and, and for, for 
to advocates to American and Alaska Native people and healthcare and issues um, because it, it, this is all based on congressional funding. Um, and so I think the more it is brought up and the more that it is talked about, um, the better chance we have of getting um, specific funds to uh, treat and treat hepatitis C in Indian country. And I t completely appreciate that question um, and I'm happy to have more conversations with anybody about that too. <clears throat> Panelists like to respond as well. Um, uh, from my perspective, I mean, I agree. I agree with Jessica. Says that would will, will really change the the pattern if if the Congress uh, would put this under discussion and their table. Now, other things social workers can do is if they have a um, outreach with the community members you know a lot of this is word of mouth still many people in the community do not know that treatments are very are, are fairly simple to deliver once you get them what it what it's difficult is to get the treatment uh, because it's very expensive but once we get the treatment very low uh, the duration is, is is very limited you know uh, as, as short as eight weeks usually 12 weeks and as long as 24 weeks and maybe 15 percent of the patients and so many patients don't want to come in because they think they know someone who received interferon in the past and had a miserable uh, clinical course because it was very, that drug had a lot of side effects so you know letting people know that treatments are much simpler and tolerable is an important message for the community uh, and, and the other message I would give is that although the CDC recommendations are uh, more aggressive with baby boomers that anybody can get infected. Um, I saw this sign, and I think it was uh, in one of the WHO uh, uh, meetings that said, "If you have blood, you can have hepatitis C." Uh, so you know everybody could be at risk, and sometimes you don't recall when the risk uh, ev event occurred. It, it was many years ago. So getting tested it never hurts. We have good tests. They're very sensitive and specific. And uh, also not everybody that has a positive test m means they have the virus. So we can confirm if you have the virus or not. So letting the people know that the general through educational campaigns or or just by, you know, uh, on one-to-one -one basis and word gets around, I think that also is very helpful. I would just like to say, like, I can't agree with Dr. Mara more, and I think that that at all levels, normalizing the discussion, um, all discussions around hepatitis C is going to be extremely necessary, not just screening for baby boomers, but um, screening for other high-risk groups. Even though it's complicated, I think that we need to talk about it. Um, and also um, access to treatment. I mean, that this is a big conversation. You know, you know, although that, although maybe um, the cost of medication is cost effective, it is still insanely priced and unattainable for so many people. And so um, there needs to be more conversations about that too. Um, and also the obvious uh, injection drug use ep epidemic and how that is impacting um, hepatitis C and HIV and um, in that population. Okay. And Chris, any last words? No, I absolutely agree with Jessica and Dr. Ramirez, um that, you know, stepping out of the, the framework of the baby boomers is so important that we have seen at Fort Peck where it wasn't the baby boomer population, it was actually the young childbearing age women that were being affected by hepatitis C. And continuing beyond that, it's the young American Indian individuals who are being affected by hepatitis C, not the baby boomers. Well, thank you all so much um, for participating in this webinar. We do have several other questions that were submitted, and I'll make sure to get those to the panelists.
post the responses when we post the slides and the recording on our website. And the slides and recording will also be emailed out to everyone who registered for this webinar. Please feel free to email me at tbroder at ndhr.org with any additional questions or comments. Um, and I'll close the webinar for today. So thank you again to all of our wonderful and audience. Thank you, everybody.